My name is Richie Buchanan, and on behalf of the Austin Lions Club, I'd like to thank you for attending our first presentation in our local military spotlight series. The purpose of our series is to get the opportunity to get, bring light to the individuals within our community that have served in the military during war times and give us an opportunity to hear their stories. Uh, just to let you know, tonight also, we will be, we'll, we'll be filming this. So in the back, after the presentation, there will be VHS tapes and DVDs available for sale on the back. Now, tonight's presentation will feature Hubie Buchanan. Hubie's a local resident from Austin, grew up here within our community, and uh, ended up joining the Air Force after graduating from college. On September 16th, September 16th 1966, while serving as a pilot during the Vietnam War, his Phantom F-4 jet was shot down. Hubie was able to eject out of the plane and parachute to the ground, but once he hit ground, he was captured by local villagers. His village, the villagers then turned him over to the North Vietnamese military, and for the next six and a half years, he was held captive as a prisoner of war. Tonight, we're gonna have the opportunity to hear his story. But to begin the evening, we're gonna start out with the uh, future leaders of Austin doing the Pledge of Allegiance. They will be followed by a gentleman named Bob Henry. Bob Henry is the director of the Atterbury Bacalar, excuse me, Atterbury Bacalar Air Museum. He's gonna give us a brief history of Vietnam and MIAs and POWs during that era. Then he will be followed by Teresa Everso Coomer. Teresa's gonna speak, speak about the impact as far as Hubie's being held as a captive as POW and his homecoming had on her life. And then following her, Hubie will come up and give his personal experiences. So if we can all rise, we're gonna say the Pledge of Allegiance with the future leaders of Austin. I pl pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good afternoon, my name's Bob Henry, like Richie explained to you there. I'm from the Atterbury Air Museum. I know there's a lot of Vietnam vets out there in the audience, and you probably haven't seen one of these uniforms in a long time. You probably wore one of these. But before I get started into the MI, POW MIA thing, I'd like to explain a little bit about what I'm doing in this uniform, although I wasn't in Vietnam. We have a new group that started up called the Vietnam Experience of Living History. And I'd like to read you something about the group. On a daily basis, we are reminded of the many freedoms we possess. One thing of which was a society we are guilty of is taking these freedoms for granted. We must be grateful every day. As a member of the Vietnam Living History Group, it is my duty and privilege to educate others so that the past defenders of freedom are not forgotten. We do this through our words and actions. The tools we have at our disposal are authentic uniforms, artifacts, reproduction items, recorded accounts, documents, ourselves, and the stories that you Vietnam vets tell us. Whether we are setting up an encampment or marching in a parade, we pay homage to those who fought and to those who perished in the Vietnam War. We are ever mindful that all veterans from all wars are our valued warriors. We have chosen the Vietnam era as our focus, and we do our best to inform and educate and remind that freedom is not free. As many as 2,000 Americans become POW MIAs of the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese. We will never know the exact number because so many died early in captivity. From the rigors of jungle life, unattended wounds, or the massive American artillery and bombing that always followed their communist captors. In this respect, the experience was similar to that of US POWs, POWs in other wars, but also different because of the unique nature of the Vietnam War. When the Viet Cong took their first American prisoners, they kept them in South Vietnam under primitive conditions. This was the norm until the late 60s when the communists realized that many of their prisoners were dying and that living prisoners might be useful in the peace negotiations. They began moving their captives to better facilities in North Vietnam. The number of Americans captured by the NVA or the VC is not known. These are the official figures of what we know of. of the 802 Southeast Asian POWs, 661 were military. 
141 civilians and foreign nationals. 472 were tortured and imprisoned in North Vietnam, some longer than eight years. 263 in South Vietnam jungle POW camps for as long as nine years. 31 in Laos, 31 in Cambodia, and five in China, two of whom were held for over 19 years. Under subhuman conditions, in early 1973, the North Vietnamese released 591 prisoners in accordance with the Paris Peace Agreement, while a further 83 are known to have died in captivity. There were 12 North Vietnamese POW camps in Southeast Asia, many of which the prisoners gave names to, like Camp Hope, Camp America, Camp Faith, Camp Alcatraz, and of course, Everybody's heard of the Hanoi Hilton, just to name a few. Americans held prisoner by the enemy had a rough time. Even when their captors were not subjecting them to deliberate abuse, they were housed in harsh conditions, denied adequate food and medical care, and refused permission to communicate with their families, as prescribed by the Geneva Convention. Some men cope with imprisonment better than others. It had been the experience of earlier wars that older men and more senior men handled the stress of being a prisoner of war better than younger men. This was more or less true of those men who became prisoners in Vietnam. Older men have memories to fall back on, have their families to worry about, and have a greater commitment to their military career. A few years ago, one of my, oh, there, oh one more side note to this. There were also eight Medal of Honor winners that were POWs in Vietnam and four of those were posthumously. Also, a friend of mine years ago wrote a poem for my museum in Columbus, or our museum, I guess, and um, he entitled it Bugle Song. He had been in World War II in Korea, and he gave it to me on the museum's second birthday, and I'd like to read it to y'all because it really, it really sends a message home. You really have to think about this. It's called Bugle Song. Raise a bugle to your lips and blow a note or two. Blow it for the boys in gray and blow it for the boys in blue. Blow it for the doughboy who perished over there. Blow it for our G.I. Joes who braved the Nazi scare. Blow it for our sailors who slept where breakers roar. Blow it for our Coast Guard keepers of our shore. Blow it for our carrier wings, the Navy's famed top gun, who caused the shades of night to fall across the rising sun. Blow it for our nurses and for our G.I. Janes. Blow it for Rosie the Riveter, who filled the sky with planes. Blow it for a few good men who stormed up Port Chop Hill. Blow it for the vets of Nam, who smell the jungle still. Blow it for our Air Force, who made the desert boil, and still the wrath of a psychopath who wanted all the oil. Blow it, brother. Blow it, sister. Sweet notes for you and me. Because of them, we're free. Because of them, we're free. Thank you very much. I'm very honored and excited to have the opportunity to tell my story to you this evening. I had no idea I would ever have the opportunity to tell it in front of Hubie Buchanan, so I'm very excited about that. I grew up and was born and raised here in Austin. Um, my family, my parents were very good friends with Jim and Margaret Buchanan. So as a little girl, I knew the story about Hubie being a prisoner of war. I also knew um, the few times that Jim and Margaret would receive word um, that Hubie was still alive, that um, he was hopefully going to come home someday. I remember how excited my parents were when they would share that news around our dinner table. I remember on several occasions, um, my dad would lead us in a prayer, thanking God that Hubie was still alive and hoping that he would get to come home. I remember that I was in the fifth grade at Austin Elementary School the day he became home to Austin. Um, my dad was a signed painter. He took a bed sheet and it's on the slides that you got to see this evening in some film clip. He painted the little love is boy and girl um, and it's, he made a sign for us that said, love is having Hubie home. And my sister and I um, stood in the schoolyard and held that sign so that he could see it. And I remember being so incredibly excited and proud. My parents had gotten us up in the middle of the night to watch Hubie on TV as he got off the airplane and uh, met his parents. 
And I remember my parents crying over that and being so excited, and I'm sure some of you do as well. Um, I remember that Austin did not have a marching band at that time, but our band practiced walking around the track to be a marching band, to be in the parade the day that Hubie came home. I remember all the businesses closing and people lining the streets. My mom worked at Nelting's um, supermarket in Crothersville, and her boss informed her that she could not take off and come to the parade, and she said she was coming to the parade. He told her she might not have a job when she got back, but she didn't care. She was at the parade. Um, it was that important to our family that we be there um, and be supporting Hubie in any way possible. After I grew up, I had the opportunity to be a civilian, but work for the United States Air Force for a number of years. And I had the opportunity to, to sing at a lot of military banquets and um, ceremonies and things like that. And I always told the story about Hubie Buchanan and our little small town. I got to meet a lot of other prisoners of war during my time working for the military. And I would hear their stories of big ticker tape parades and lots of uh, fancy hoopla when they came back. And I would kind of um, share the story of our little small town, but doing everything that we knew to possibly do to show this man how proud we were of him and how much he meant to us on that day. Um, at one point, I was in Caribou, Maine at Loring Air Force Base, and I was singing for a five-star general there who had come. The, the people that attended the banquet that night were so distinguished, I was not even allowed to attend the banquet. Um, I had to be stay in another room and got to come out just because I was the entertainment. Um, but I came and I told the story of Hubie, and I began to sing just one verse of America the Beautiful. And at that point, um, men and women in uniform all over the room started to stand at attention just sporadically. And I was so moved by that. And they were so moved about the story of a little town that honored a man who had made such an impression on their life that after I finished um, singing that evening, the general asked for me to come back into the room and he met with me and he had tears streaming down his face and he said, Austin, Indiana, Hubie Buchanan, I will remember it as long as I live. And then I got to work in California and Colorado, working with military men and women who, as they were transitioning from military service to civilian careers, I helped them to prepare for civilian life. I helped them in preparing for jobs and preparing for um, buying a home, relocating to an area of their choice for once, those types of things. And I used to conduct seminars, week-long seminars, once a month for 80 to 120 men and women in all five branches of the military. I always ended my seminars telling the story of Hubie Buchanan coming to Austin, Indiana. And I always took the opportunity, and I wanted to, to tell any of you here who are veterans the same story that I would tell them. If no one has ever said thank you for the incredible service and dedication that you have given, I want to be the first that says that. On behalf of my family, I have two living sons and a daughter, and I have been able to raise my family um, with the privilege of being in a country that's free. I've also had the incredible honor and privilege to work with men and women who've dedicated their lives and their careers to serving in the United States um, Army, Air Force, Marines, Navy, and Coast Guard. And so I appreciate everything that anyone who has served in the military has done to ensure my freedom and the freedom of my family. I also um, never close my eyes at night without being grateful for the opportunity to live in this country and for the dedication and sacrifice of men like Hubie Buchanan who have given that right to me. I appreciate everything that goes into a military career, a military service, because I, for one, was one of the people that got to see the impact that that has on a family and on your life. I want to make sure that he knows and that any of you who are veterans know that it is appreciated, it impacted my life, it definitely um, made me very patriotic, very appreciative, and very proud 
of who I am and where I come from. And that service has not gone unnoticed, at least in my life. And I know that I have passed that on to my, my children. My boy's father served for 23 years in the United States Air Force. And we traveled the country and got to, to see so many things and meet so many people. But until you've been there, done that, you may not really realize the incredible sacrifice that these people make for us to have the freedoms that we have. Um, I would like to share with you just the one verse that is my favorite from America the Beautiful because it talks about people like Hubie Buchanan and other men and women who have dedicated their life to military service. Oh, beautiful, for heroes proved in liberating strife. Who more than self their country loved and mercy more than life. America, America, may God thy gold Ladies and gentlemen, it is my incredible privilege to introduce Mr. Hubie Buchanan. For the uh, welcome tonight and for the welcome that some of you gave me when it was many years ago. I appreciate that. It's uh, always great to be back in Austin. I've been to a lot of places around the world, but uh, like they always say, there's no place like home. So tonight, uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit uh, about my experience. When I was uh, 25 years old, I found myself in a little cell. When you stood against the back wall, and you took just uh, three paces, you had run right into another wall. And when you held your hands out, you could touch both of the side walls. So it was a fairly small place, and it was located in the People's Democratic Republic of Vietnam, which uh, we call North Vietnam. And so people have often wondered how I get from Austin to that place. So I was trying to think of a good starting point, and I think it was probably while I was in high school, I was about 17, my brother Don saw that I was sitting around doing almost nothing like usual, and he said, why don't you do something useful, uh, something interesting? You've, have you ever been in an airplane? I, no, I'd never had any interest in airplanes. He said, if you go up to Seymour, you could just for a few dollars, it'll take you for a little ride around the airport, and you know, maybe you'll like it. So I went up there that day and found a place. They'd, they'd do just what uh, he had suggested. And after we took off, it was just like a little kite to me. It was called an Aronka Champion. It had pilots in the front and a passenger in the back. And uh, after we flew a little bit, uh, I'm pretty interested in mechanical things and machinery, so I wanted to know how he was flying this thing around, and he let me fly it some. We started turning, and we just forgot about looking at the scenery. And uh, after we landed, he said, you know, you ought to take some lessons. Look like you're interested in this. So I thought that was kind of good. So I decided to take lessons, and he just happened to be an instructor. So he's, he's kind of a salesman, I think. But anyway, he talked me into it. So every week after that, uh, I would go up and take one lesson on Saturday. And it was just when they were building Interstate 65 out here. So they had poured the pavement, but they hadn't put in any signs. They had uh, no landscaping. They also had no traffic and no police. So you could just drive around those and get up to Seymour really fast. <laughs> so I found out the prices were kind of expensive for taking lessons in airplanes. And people said you could just join the military and they would train you for free. And not only that, they would pay for the gas and pay you a salary while you're doing it. So I kind of investigated what might be good there. And 
I thought about the Marines, but then they say that Marine pilots are also soldiers because they have to live in tents and they uh, crawl around the dirt and things. So I didn't think that was too good. The Navy, they, they stay out in boats with a bunch of sailors all the time. I didn't think that was too good. So Air Force, that sounded like the best thing. So that's, that's what I had in mind. In order to be a military pilot, you first have to be an officer, and that requires that you be a college graduate, so it was off to college. So as I graduated from college, I uh, joined the Air Force, went to uh, officer's training school, became a second lieutenant, and then to pilot training. It takes about uh, 54 weeks at that time to be a, an Air Force pilot. And after I finish that, you're given an award of an airplane that you're going to fly. And the Air Force has bombers and tankers and transports and fighters, just about everything imaginable, even helicopters. I wanted a fighter, and you don't always get what you want, but I was assigned to the F-4 Phantom II, which at that time was the world's fastest airplane. It could go twice the speed of sound, 1,000 miles an hour, Mach 2. It could climb to uh, 50,000 feet, you know, more than 10 miles high. So it looked like a pretty good thing, except it had one disadvantage. Most fighters have one pilot, because pilots all want to do the flying. It's kind of like video games. It's a lot more fun to play the game yourself rather than sit and watch somebody else. This one had two, two pilots. The new guy out of pilot training goes in the back. It's called the pilot systems operator. Runs radar, communication, things like that, different weapon systems. The guy up front, he's the aircraft commander, he's the boss. He gets to do most of the flying. And if he gets tired or feels good that day, he lets the guy in the back fly a little bit. So you kind of get the leftovers. But they promised in about six or eight months, we'd get to move from the back seat to the front. So it seemed bearable, it didn't seem too bad. I was sent to uh, Arizona to get trained in the backseat of an F-4 and then went to Eglin Air Force Base in Florida. And there we were part of the 16th Tactical Fighter Squadron, which had to call a worldwide commitment. We could be called out to go anywhere in the world in just a few hours. And so we never knew when we are going to go or where we were going to go. We had all kinds of equipment. We had uh, desert equipment and jungle equipment, Arctic. We had to get the vaccinations for any disease in the world, and they were always giving us booster shots or coming up with something else. That was always happening. But at the same time, there was a little problem going on in Vietnam. As the North tended to infiltrate the South, send troops and supplies down to mm, cause trouble in the southern part, the ally of the United States. So President Johnson sent ground troops, and he also started a bombing campaign against the North to try to cut off those routes. And before I got to upgrade, they sent me over to Southeast Asia. It's kind of a strange life. I was uh, sent to Yuban, Thailand. That's just to the west of Vietnam. In order to get to Vietnam, you had to fly over Laos and uh, then into Vietnam. But at this base, it was a peaceful country, ally of the United States. The uh, life there was very good. We'd, a typical day, we'd get up in the morning and go to a briefing. They'd have, uh, be smaller than this place, but they'd have a stage and they'd have intelligence officers come out, tell about uh, possible defenses or NA aircraft guns that would be in our target area. They'd have weather people to predict what the cloud cover or the weather situation would be at both where you are and uh, in Vietnam. Lots of information, weapons systems, tech, uh, technical people would talk about the capabilities of different weapons. And uh, we'd go to this briefing, and then they would bring out some envelopes that are marked top secret. And those were the targets that you're going to be going to that day. So you're given your target, and you rip it open, and you see where your target is. Then you go into planning, where you find out the best route in, and 
plan what you're going to do. You get all your equipment on. We wore about 45 pounds of equipment and go out to the airplane. And four F-4s would generally go, a flight of four, take off. They stay together. They cross Laos, go into Vietnam, and you get to the border, they start shooting at you. Then you fly over to your target. This type of airplane dives down on its target and then pulls up after it drops its bombs. And then you fly back and they shoot at you all the way to the border again. The targets, much as to our surprise, were not very important. They were usually just little dirt roads and little bamboo bridges, nothing of great significance. In fact, if you were, happened to be lucky enough to have a direct hit on one of these bridges, they'd probably have it built good as new the next day. But that's the way the war was run. If we saw a building or a factory or a power plant or anything else, that was off limits. The rules of engagement didn't allow us to do anything except hit these specific targets. I think they didn't want to annoy anyone or hurt anybody or make any country mad, mad at us. So it was rather restrictive. Seemed like a very difficult way to win a war. But that was our job, so that's what we did. But then after we'd fly back, you have all the rest of the day till the next day. So you can go into Yuban. It's a fairly good sized city. You could go to a restaurant or a movie, go shopping. Very peaceful. Kind of a, a strange situation. They're shooting at you one minute and everybody's very friendly the next. On base, it was very comfortable. We were treated uh, not like royalty, but very nice. And I suspect because we were the only people who ever got shot at. So. Any place we went, they would always be very nice to us. And in the officer's club at night, we flew in steak and lobster and fresh food. And it was very easy life for us, very nice. But they shot at you a lot, so it did have some disadvantages. On the 16th of September, 1966, flight of uh, four F-4s took off. I was with Major John Robertson, he's the, my aircraft commander. He's the flight leader, typically. He's a little higher rank than most, so we were usually the lead uh, on a combat strike. And uh, flights like this took off about every 30 minutes, 24 hours a day. So there was always a lot of activity. And we're just one base. There are a lot of bases in Thailand. They were also taking off from South Vietnam, even the Marines came up after coming out of their tents. They would come up, and the Navy guys would fly from their ships over. So there are a lot of airplanes flying all the time. So we had what's called an alpha strike this day, which is a very big operation involving hundreds of airplanes. And it's very near uh, the capital city of uh, Hanoi, way up in the north. Because it's such a long flight, we had to refuel in the air. So we flew across Laos and Vietnam, went out over the uh, Gulf of Tonkin, and met a tanker, hooked into the tanker and refueled. Three airplanes were all set, and then when the fourth one tried to connect, they were having some mechanical problems. And eventually they could not take on fuel and therefore could not complete the mission. So they had to return, turned around and went back to base. So our flight continued on. This was the day that, while we typically are the lead airplane, our, uh, my aircraft commander, Major Robertson, sometimes would allow subordinates fly as the lead so that they would get some combat experience. This is one of the days that he allowed someone else to lead the flight. So we were the third airplane in a flight of three. We continued on up offshore of Vietnam. No guns out there. And turned in near the uh, port city of Haiphong and headed toward our target, which was a bridge up in the general area of Hanoi in the Red River Delta. As we're flying inland, someone in our flight said that there are MIGs behind us at 6 o'clock. Look back, and sure enough, there are four MIG-17s behind us, which is not really a big deal because they're kind of far back. 
And a MiG-17 is about, oh, maybe 10 years or more older than an F-4 and much less advanced in many ways. About the only thing that the uh, MiG-17 can do better than an F-4 is to turn at a greater rate. But since the strategy of an F-4 is to not turn, it's very little threat to us. So our procedure, accelerate away, climb, turn back, come head on, and shoot them down with radar-guided missiles. Today, the lead decided to make a turn. We started a big climbing turn around. And the MiGs, just as advertised, began to cut off in the corner and come closer and closer to us. And it became very apparent that we're going to have some shots go across very quickly. And it wasn't long. First burst of shells went over the canopy of the airplane. And then I said, I think the next one's going to get us, because he corrected. And then the plane just went out of control. So I ejected from the plane. Uh, Something, any fighters like uh, F-4, you have to be blasted out of the airplane in order to get out of them. You can't jump out or anything. So they have cannon shells during this period of time that would just blast you out of, out of the airplane. The seat and everything you're in just blasts out of the airplane. And a parachute opens, you hope, because you only have the one parachute. There's no reserve or... Any backup system, it works or it doesn't, but it, it worked for me. And as I'm drifting down, I know there's no rescue in this area because it's too close to Hanoi, and they told us before we left that if you get shot down here, you're on your own. Nobody's going to rescue you. Other places in Vietnam, they do almost anything to get you out. So as I'm coming down, I see near a little village, there's a person in uniform off to my right has a... Uh, rifle, and he's running toward me, but he's kind of far away. And there's a group, look like maybe farmers or villagers, and they have machetes and uh, pitchforks, things like that. They're going to be much closer to me. So I hit the ground with all kinds of equipment which we carried. You had survival radios and vests and floats and uh, 38 caliber. We had all kinds of things with us. About the second I got everything started loose, I was swamped by many people. So I was captured uh, immediately. They tied me up and took me to this little village just a short distance away, and I went into one of the houses. And people were mostly just kind of curious. They weren't hostile. They were just kind of curious what's going on. This is an unusual event, and Americans look a lot different than Vietnamese. So I was there for a while, and then um, a Vietnamese officer, I would say, someone in uniform showed up, which I always think of like a political commissar in a, in a communist country. And he started giving a speech and getting people all excited. And pretty soon, they're not so friendly anymore. They get kind of hostile. But I'm in a building, and they're outside, so it's not too bad. Then. When they see that there's no rescue apparent, that nothing's going to happen, they think it's time for, to transport me. So I'm led out of this village and down some dirt roads. And eventually, there's a couple of soldiers come along. They stand on each side of me, and they have a rifle. Well, at first, that wasn't a good thing. That's the enemy. But later on, maybe it's not so bad, because then we came to another village, and the old political commissar has been there ahead of us, and he's got everybody riled up where they're not friendly at all. In fact, they're throwing things and trying to hit me and all kinds of things. And we have to get through that village to get on the other side. And these two guys are real close to me, and I'm close to them. And they probably got hit a lot more than I did because they're on the outside. But they were not friendly. And we went through several villages like that, one after another. And I was fairly fortunate because uh, sometimes people did not survive that. Occasionally, the evidence is that some people, uh, the crowds got a little out of control. But I made it through that, and I was later put in an old car and driven for several hours. 
and I thought we'd probably be going to Hanoi. And at the outskirts of the town, I was blindfolded, and we were taken into, uh, through the city streets. I could raise the blindfold occasionally. I knew I was in a city. I was taken to a big prison, and I would later find out this place is called Wallo Prison by the Vietnamese. It was built by the French, probably 1880s. Big stone walls around it, broken glass on top, uh, electrified barbed wire, very ominous looking place. Went in there and Americans called it uh, Hanoi Hilton Heartbreak Hotel. This section is the New Guy Village. That's where people are initially interrogated. You're taken in there and they begin to ask you questions. And the Geneva Conventions say that we can voluntarily say name, rank, serial number, date of birth. And that's all we're required to say. They're not supposed to ask you any more than that, which meant nothing, of course. They wanted to know a whole lot of things. They wanted to know like what targets you're going to hit the next few days and all kinds of information about you. And if you stick with name, rank, serial number, which I guess everybody did for quite a while, until they decide to start doing things. Then they, they began torturing, which the reception of all the prisoners at that time. They had a lot of different things they did. If a person had a broken arm or leg, they would twist it. If um, that, they didn't have any injuries, then they used the primary system was ropes, they call it. They had several different ways of doing ropes. Uh, one is they have big wrist manacles made out of heavy steel and they have a bolt in the center and they use a wrench to tighten that down on your wrists. Make your elbows go out like this. That's behind your back. And they put something like that on your legs and then they tie ropes around your elbows behind your back and then pull them until the elbows touch. Which might not sound too bad, but it hurts. And it, um, well, it's some of the things other prisoners said, they said, you maybe want to die, but we're not gonna let you. And some people fainted during it from the pain. Sometimes the bone would pop out of the socket from that. You'd be paralyzed, your hands sometimes be paralyzed depending on different circumstances. Some people would be maybe for several days, but everybody, you know, for a few hours, you'd be paralyzed after this. Anyway, they had that, they had beatings, they had a lot of different things. And eventually, unlike the movies in Hollywood, everybody would have to say something. So you'd begin to talk, and as we were trained, you have to fall back on something. So we try to limit the information we might give out, try to falsify it. So I made up what it's, I thought was pretty obviously fictitious. I tried to make it sound as good as possible and as un inaccurate as possible. And much to my surprise, they seemed to believe everything I said, which made it not too good in some way. Because when you have two pilots, you torture both and you see what the stories are. You see if they match. Why would they accept my story? Because it wasn't right. John Robertson would be given a different story but they never questioned it. Then, of course, that probably indicated he was not a prisoner. There's not too many options. The plane's out of control. It didn't look good for John Roberts. So um, they had no significant information really to tell them because everything we knew, top secret, we got it just before our flights. So the government knew about those possible circumstances, and they really never gave us any information like that, whether it would be terribly useful. So it wasn't too long. They seemed to kind of lose interest in me the next day. This went on into the next day. So the next day I was transported to another camp. I was put in a um, little Jeep, blindfolded, which you can pull up occasionally, and went into another place, which is found out to be called the zoo. That's the American name for it. It was an old French film studio. And uh, it was probably built back in the turn of the century. I went to, uh, the first stop was to see the camp commander. 
And uh, there they kind of tell you the, the rules of the game. Said, uh, meet him. And he said, uh, you're not a prisoner of war. You're a criminal. So this, there is no declared war. And therefore, you've been bombing our people. And you're a criminal. And you'll be treated like a criminal. And we want you to suffer for your crimes. You'll have nothing. There's nothing for you to read, nothing for you to do. You'll have blank room and sit and look at the walls and ponder your crimes. That's a famous phrase, ponder your crimes. Then he said, you have two choices. He said, we have a set of camp regulations here. There are about 12, 12 rules on this paper. You say, if you follow these, even though you're a criminal and you follow these rules, We'll treat you humanely, and someday you'll go home. If you don't follow every rule, you're not going to be treated. You're going to be very badly treated, and you'll never go home. So I was interested in those rules, so I looked at it, and the first one said, uh, keep your room neat and clean. I said, hmm, that's not so bad. I think I could probably do that. You know, I work at it. I could probably do it. Then I read the second one. It said you have to answer every question that the Vietnamese officers ask of you, which our military code of conduct says can't do that. Then it says uh, things like you have to write any statement that we want, make any kind of written statement that we desire you to write. We can't do that. It said you can't communicate with any other American. You can't look at any other prisoner. Can't do that. In fact, I couldn't do any of those rules, every one of them. I was wondering if I could get extra credit by doing that first, first one really well, but <laughs> didn't work that way. So, this is sort of like this is the ground rules. This is kind of our little war here. They wanted to use this for propaganda, and uh, they were going to use just about any means to make, get what they wanted from us. And, uh, our little war was to resist that. So it wasn't going to be just sitting there for five and a half years. It was going to be an active, everyday battle against the, uh, our little war there in North Vietnam. So they put me in a room, in a cell. And before they do, much to my surprise, they give me some things. They give me a little, little teapot like this to put water in. I got a straw mat like you use on the beach in the United States, real thin little straw mat. I had a mosquito net, which is like worth its weight in gold in a place like Vietnam. Had a little bar of lye soap, kind of brown, a uh, little tube of toothpaste and a toothbrush. I was amazed. A uh, cup, had a bucket with a lid, that's the bathroom, and uh, put me in this room. And I was pretty tired, because been through a lot of, a lot of things, Hadn't had any sleep for a long time. So I just pulled this mosquito net up over my head and went to sleep instantly. And while I'm sleeping, I have a strange dream. I feel like something just hit me, like a little piece of paper hit me in the face. And I open my eyes, and there's, there's a little piece of paper there. It's all rolled up about like a cigarette, a little brown piece of paper. I don't know where that thing came from. And I look right up in the wall. It's like 14 feet high. There's a little hole in the wall, maybe where an old electric wire used to go across from one room to another. And apparently somebody s stuck that through there. Well, the room's totally dark because during the day, no light gets in. They have mats over the doors and windows so you can't see out because you're not allowed to see anybody else. The impression is you're the only one in the world. Nobody else is out there. That's what they want to try to have you think. And I go over underneath the door. That's the only source of light. A little, little light shining underneath the door. And I try to read this thing. It says tap. Tap code. Excuse me. And um, it has the letters of the alphabet there. A nice square. A matrix. Five letters in there. The letter K is omitted. And it said tap on the wall. And I I could hardly read it, and I also couldn't understand it. And I tried everything trying to figure this out. I could not understand what this was. So I just turned it over and I put it on there, say again, 
I used my toothpaste tube to write on that thing. I found if you used the edge of it, it was made of the metal lead, and it would actually make a little, little line. So I wrote in there, say again, and I stuck it through the hole back to the other room. And about maybe 45 minutes later, a piece of paper came back through into my room. And it was a little bit more of an explanation. It said that uh, you tap on the wall. The first time you tap, it indicates which row of letters that we're looking at. The second tap tells you which letter in that row. So if you're going to do A, you do first row, first letter. If you're doing Z, it would be Five, five. And then I understood. I understood what they said. And for the letters K, which was omitted, you could just substitute C, or you could use six dots for it. So then I could communicate. So if I could jump ahead about six years, we got out of prison, and I'm talking to people, and I run in to the two people that were in that room next to me. One's named Art Cormier. He's a uh, paramedic that came off a rescue helicopter that was shot down. And his cellmate was John Pitchford, who was an F-100 pilot, who during capture had been shot through the upper arm so that it didn't connect anymore, never connected. And he was infected and needed some assistance. So they put them together so that uh, the medic could help the other person. And this, Art Cormier said, I've been wondering for seven years how in the world you did what you did. He said, we had to climb up. I had to get up on this board just for our bed, get up and lean against the wall. And then the other guy climbed up my back, got way up on my shoulders, stood up, <laughs> leaned up against the wall, and he just barely made it. He stuck the thing through the wall. And then five minutes later, came back, <laughs> He said, we knew that you're the only person in that room and there was nothing in there with you because nobody has anything in their room. He said, we've been wondering. He said, you're either 10 feet tall or you can really jump. <laughs> well, the way I did it, I didn't even think much about it at the time. They had this little mat, you know, that we slept on. I just rolled that up tight and I took the center of it and I pulled on it and it just stretched out, and stretched out, and stretched out into a big long hole. Put the note up there on the very top and stuck it in the hole and then hit it. <laughs> so that introduced me to the tap code, which uh, had many, many different variations and uses. Sounds like a really awkward thing to use, but when you have a lot of time, it works great. It's one of its advantages is you can quickly get it to someone else, because that's when your most exposure is, when you're giving it to a new group of people. And any new person coming in, you have to get the, the code, and that often requires you get caught. It's sort of like the cost of doing business. Once or twice a year, you're gonna have an unpleasant period while they punish you for your bad attitude, giving them the tap code. But some of the ways uh, it was used, uh, in a small camp, you got 30 people. Nobody's supposed to look out, but everybody's figured out a way of drilling a hole or looking out anyway. That's just the way it goes. So you look out, and anybody walking by, you're taken out to maybe go wash, you're taking out to go to an interrogation, or maybe do some sweeping or cleaning. So as you walk around, people would, they just use their fingers. Mm -hmm. That's HB, that would be me. Because we know all the names, and we know, there's, know what the initials are, so you just do that and we know who you are. Or if you're taken out at, in the night for some reason, you know. You can even cough, just cough that many times and we know who's being taken away. It doesn't take much and you can do a lot of communication. One of the best things, it's amazingly enough, they didn't catch on, they used it for seven years, uh, is just sweeping. Vietnamese aren't very high tech. They used uh, bamboo for their brooms and no stick on it. They just 
take a wad of bamboo and they lean over and sweep like that. Sometimes they'd have us go out and sweep. And of course, when you sweep, it's one, two, one, two, three, one, two. So it was sort of like a radio broadcast and it would go all over the whole camp. It was so noisy. Somehow they never figured that out for all the time I was there. But the senior ranking officer, whoever's the most senior ranking US military in the prison camp, he's the boss of the prisoners. Even though we're never in contact, everything is passed on tap code and the orders are the same regardless of whether he told you or the guy next door told you. So somebody would sweep. If there's any new orders coming out, if there's any news or rumors, somebody new's been shot down, that's our main source of info, some new guy gets shot down. So that, that went on. Um, one of the best ways was to use a wire. One time, we weren't always alone. Uh, at various times, we had different amount of roommates. Sometimes, uh, a lot of times you're solo. I was uh, solitary confinement for about six months. The longest I've heard of someone was about four years. But that's, that's not a big deal, solitary confinement. But then uh, you're given maybe one cellmate or two, sometimes four or five, depending on which camp, which time during the imprisonment. There were a few times we were in rooms as much as 50 people toward the end of the war. But typically, there would just be a small little group of you, a handful, three, four people. Anyway, two of us were in this cell block. And the cell block had been divided into little tiny cells that were totally com separated from all the others. They had no common walls, so cut down on communication. They had a little rat hole, we called them. They were a drain hole cut in the walls so that when you clean the room, the water would run out. We called them rat holes because that's where the rats went, in and out. And uh, we found that the Vietnamese had thrown a lot of junk between our cell and the neighboring cell. All kinds of things in there. And if you stick your hand out the rat hole and reach around, you could feel little pieces of wire. So we took the wire, put it together, made a big long wire, so much that we could put it through our rat hole in past all this trash into the next rat hole into this next cell. And that was almost the perfect thing because it was silent. You just pull and nobody would ever know. So we ran this in there and the person grabbed it on the other end. We could tell somebody just grabbed the wire. And so we start to send a tap code and he didn't respond. He just sort of gibberish, you know, like, what's this? Ah, must be a new guy, doesn't know the tap code. Pull the wire back, make up our little matrix of letters, put it on the end, send it back through. Ah, he's got it. Give him a little time to practice. Very good. First thing, exchange names. If anybody goes home, you want to be able to say who's prisoner so they don't get left behind. We give them our name. We asked for his. He says, my name is T-E-R-R-Y. Terry, good. U-Y-E-Y-A, oh, wait a minute, That's, that doesn't make any sense. They try again, he said, U-Y-E-Y-A, wow, well, that doesn't make sense. Try again. U, Y, wow, I don't think the guy knows tap code yet. Something's wrong. Pretty soon he says, I am a Japanese American. My name is Terry Uyama. <laughs> Just call me Terry. <laughs> it did have some disadvantages that way. Another time, I thought they had broken down communication for us because about five of us were taken to a camp where they had gone even further. They built a little house, and around the little house was a wall made of brick, very high. Couldn't see over it. Every other building was just the same, rows of these buildings, totally isolated by walls. We tried everything, trying to figure out how we're ever going to communicate with the people in these other places. And then 
Somebody had to go out and sweep. We're listening, and somebody's out there with a bamboo broom, and it says, shh, 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 says, look through your gate at 12 noon. Well, we knew when it was 12 noon because the Vietnamese had a radio on all the time. And at 12 noon, it went, doot, 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 doot. So we always knew when it was 12 noon. We look out a little crack in our door that's lined up with a crack in the gate, just perfectly. You look through the crack in the gate, there was a little board part missing off of a gate next door. And you look through that, you could see just a couple of inches of the bottom of a door. And at 12 noon, a little flag came out. It went doot, 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 back and forth, tap code. And so we had, from that, we had communication with every building in the whole camp. So we were back in the loop again almost instantly. Happened for the whole time I was in prison. The same kind of thing. So let's see. That, just tell you what a typical day is like. A day when they don't want anything. They're not after you for anything. They weren't after you for stuff all the time. It's just occasionally this came up. But a typical day, you'd just say, brush about dawn or 6 o'clock, they would beat on a piece of metal, like a rim of a tire, a gong, wake you up. Then maybe half an hour later, they'd come by and give you a Vietnamese cigarette, which seemed kind of strange to us. I mean, the treatment wasn't that good, and they're giving you cigarettes. Not enough food, but they give you a cigarette. Have a cigarette. Then after a little while, they'd take you out, and you could go wash with the Vietnamese style, which is to take a cup and pour water over your head. And while you're out there, you know, people could leave a little message. You could take a little thread out of your clothing, tie knots into it. You could leave your name on that little piece of thread somewhere, right where people use things, or leave little messages. Let's say when sometimes when they sweep, they have lots of jokes and things, you know, talk about Ho Chi Minh, the president of uh, North Vietnam little comments like that. A lot of jokes that way. So after washing, you come back in, and they would feed you. Typical food would be a plate of rice. Then you'd have something like cabbage or pumpkin, usually one or the other. And you'd have it pieces of cabbage floating around in hot water. That was sort of like a soup, but there was no flavoring, no salt. It was cabbage, and it was water. Then they'd have some of the same cabbage that had been cooked like it was fried. It was just mashed up and just a few tablespoons. And then you'd, that would be your meal. Then uh, you'd go to bed. They also played some propaganda for us. They'd probably read some propaganda about how great the uh, war's going for the North and how everything's falling apart in the United States and how we're killing babies and all that kind of things. Um, then we take a nap, everybody in North Vietnam, except the guards, took a nap. And I, I don't know, maybe an hour and a half, quite long. After that, they ring the gong again, wake you up, and uh, they give you another, uh, let's see, uh, at the end of the meal, that uh, first meal, they give you another cigarette, because we get three a day, three cigarettes a day. And uh, so after the nap, they wake you up, and you get to sit there until the evening meal. There's nothing going on for hours and hours and hours and hours. And all this is communication time. It takes a lot of time to do communication and not get caught. So you wait around, the evening meal comes, and it's just like the other meal, exactly the same. Could be the same. You could have the same meal twice a day for two months, three months. It just depends. goes on for a long time. And then they would ring the gong at night, and that was go to bed time. And that was good time, because if you're locked in at night, they generally didn't come and get you too much during the night. So that was very secure to be locked in, because it locked them out. Well, sometimes, let's say there was a, an attempted rescue attempt at Sante, and uh, the place had been abandoned, but it frightened the Vietnamese that they thought that maybe they would try to rescue other prisoners. So they took all the prisoners and took them into Hanoi, back into Wallo Prison. And because they had no choice 
instead of being in solitary confinement or small rooms, they put us together in big rooms. We'd have 30, uh, 45, 50 people per room, which really changed our whole life during that period of time because we were very organized then and find out the people are very talented. We had uh, people who spoke French and people who spoke Spanish. We had people who were mathematical whizzes. We had uh, a person who had been a professor of literature at the Air Force Academy, a very, very talented group overall. And in the evenings, they would have a whole entertainment and educational programs. One of the people that was quite popular was Jerry Financi. He worked in a movie theater all during high school. He had uh, hundreds and hundreds of movies that he could tell you every detail and almost recite the lines. And so he would tell movies every night. So all kinds of activities at night, all kinds of things going on. Everybody had their little jobs and much, much better life. Now one of the things, there's actually quite a bit of humor in a place like prison and people uh, like to play practical jokes. There was one person, Wally Newcomb, was famous for his humor and things. Toward the end of the war, we were in a big room and they were trying to fatten us up a little bit because we were down on our weight and they even gave us a cookie. They were gonna give each person a cookie this day. So Dan Dowdy had been assigned the job. He is cookie control officer. His job, <laughs> he's gonna make sure everybody gets one cookie and no cheating. So he's kind of a particular guy. He wants everything to go exactly right. He's pretty nervous about anything getting messed up. So he counts all these cookies and made sure that he was given 48 cookies. He's not going to just do it once. He counts them over and over. He's got 48 cookies, and he's going to devise a way so that everybody comes up because he doesn't ever want things to go wrong. He's, he's a guy that wants precision. So he says he's going to have everybody line up and come walking by and take one cookie. So he's got the box there. He takes his out first, and then everybody files by, and they take a cookie. When Wally Newcomb comes by, he reaches in. He acts like he's got a cookie, but he doesn't have one. He would rather go hungry and be funny <laughs> than to take a cookie. So he goes on by, and then the last person comes up, and Dan's very happy because he's, he's done it. It's all perfect. And he looks down, there's one cookie. <laughs> that just drives He didn't know what to do. Did he divide it up into 48 pieces? Did he miscount? He, very flustered. He had a hard time with things like that. The um, idea of time for the Vietnamese was a little bit different than ours. You know, we were there for quite a while. And uh, I remember that, uh, I forget the name of the prisoner, but he had been there for many years. And we occasionally get taken to these uh, Vietnamese, I guess they're to convince us to join the Vietnamese army or something. I, it was, they would talk to you about various things like that. Or coming over to their side, it was pretty ridiculous. But we had these little talks. <laughs> Did have those occasionally. Anyway, this person went to the little talk and the prisoner said, you know, I've been here a long time. When am I gonna go home? And well, the Vietnamese says, well, I think you're going to go home soon. Really, you are, you're going to go home soon. So the prisoner says, wow, oh, really? And he said, yes, he said, I think you'll go home soon. It's maybe not this year, it's maybe not next year, but really soon, very soon. <laughs> so they thought a little bit differently than we did on a lot of things. The uh, American prisoners in Vietnam were the longest held in any war in history. And uh, that came up one time when we don't, couldn't give any kind of gifts for Christmas or birthdays or things like that. So we just give virtual gifts. And you know, so you'd say, I know this guy really likes uh, the tropics and things. Uh, okay, I'll tap, tap and I say, I'm gonna, for Christmas, I'm gonna give you uh, a trip to Hawaii and 10 gallons of chocolate chip ice cream. That's his favorite, you know. 
Well, this one person, he knew his birthday's coming up and they're probably gonna come up with a gift for him. So he tapped on the wall and he said, uh, for a birthday gift, he said, I, I have a suggestion. And he says, just, just one request. He said, I've been held a prisoner longer than any other American POW in history. He said, will you stop referring to me as the new guy here? <laughs> so in 1972, there's uh, some negotiations going on. They've been going on for quite a while, but uh, it took years. It took forever for them to decide on what type of table to talk. So it went on forever. We didn't pay much attention, but we had, uh, say, news analysts. They would listen to all the propaganda. Mike Cronin was a Naval Academy graduate. He was a very smart guy. He used to listen to all the news and figure out what they didn't say. He'd see what's omitted from these different things. And he came up with very accurate predictions on what's going on. He said, this is serious. We're going we're gonna to see an end to this. And even the Vietnamese, after a while, started asking us if we got enough to eat. They didn't give us more to eat, but they at least asked. You know, it, it showed a little difference in attitude. Said, do you want to go stand in the sun, you know, get a suntan? Which we didn't. They didn't let us, but they thought about it. So that's, you start seeing their thinking, you know, maybe these guys are going to go home. So that was kind of optimistic, and Christmas was coming up, so we thought, that's everything as always, will we be home for Christmas, home for Christmas. That's what everybody always thought like. So we were hoping, and then they said, the peace talks are off. The United States, those bad Americans, have done it again. They ruined everything, and the peace talks are off, you'll probably be here forever. And things went on for a few days. And suddenly they said, oh, the Americans have started to bomb. Because there hadn't been any bombing in North Vietnam for years. There had been a moratorium. You know, if you negotiate, we won't bomb you, that kind of thing. So there hadn't been any bombing. And they said, oh, we're getting bombed here. Not good. Terrible Americans are bombing. They're, they're mining Haiphong Harbor. They're really doing a lot of bad things. Uh, how do you feel? Everything okay? You know, you need more food? So we kind of liked the sound of it because there was an inverse relationship. Whenever they were getting hurt, they were nice to us and treated us better. Whenever they were doing pretty well, the treatment got worse. So we were always wanting to hit them hard. That was always good. Well, it went on for several days. They told us there was bombing going on. And then they didn't tell us anything. Everything was silent. There was nothing. No propaganda, no conversations with anybody. Just, they were gone. Just nothing. We knew something was up. And then one night trucks came to take us back to Hanoi. When we got back to Hanoi, we walked into Wallow Prison, which was not like the place we left. It was all cleaned up, it was whitewashed, all the mats had been taken off the windows and doors. And not only did they not care whether you saw other Americans, they were yelling down to us, saying, hey, how you guys doing? Come on back in here. They said, you missed the party. You should have seen the fireworks display that we had. So we found out about it the next day. They said it had been years. There hadn't been anything going on as far as an air raid. And then, about the 18th of December, after these negotiations broke down, they said, all of a sudden, the walls began to shake and plaster started shaking down from the ceiling. And there were bombs going off all around. And then there was bombs going off over here. And then they could hear them here. And then anti-aircraft guns began to fire, which hadn't been fired in a long time. All kinds of activity, bombs going off everywhere. Most raids in the past would last for maybe 20 minutes and then it'd be all over with. Then the sirens started going. They were really late. The planes had already left probably by the time the air raid sirens went off. But the planes kept coming. And instead of a 20 minute raid, it went on for hours and hours and hours. They'd never seen anything like it. The guards, who are usually really young people, maybe 17, 
Well, they had not experienced this, and they were running around. They said some of them were crying, some had lost their rifles, and they were little foxholes they would jump into for air raids. And these things had been filling up with water over the years because they're never used. So they jumped in those, and then they're worried about they stick their head into the water and they bring it up. Anyway, it's total chaos. And the Americans, of course, were yay, cheering. Because when they get hurt, we're closer to being out. That was always our philosophy. And uh, the raid went on all day, unheard of. So at night, it starts to become twilight, and suddenly it does get quiet. Things stop. And everybody's, wow, that was quite a show. You know, that's gone on for hours. Never seen anything like it. And then it was dark. And then there was a different sound, and it was louder than the previous because, as they could tell from the sounds, there were B-52s had come. They'd never been near Hanoi in the past because there are a lot of material up there, easy to shoot down. The B-52s came at night, and they dropped hundreds and hundreds of bombs on every airplane, and they just came in row after row of B-52s. As soon as one would leave, there'd be another one come in. The guns were firing, it's just like 4th of July, and I don't know at what period of time, but eventually the guns stopped. Everybody thought they probably have no more ammunition. They fired everything there was. They have no more anti-aircraft, and the planes kept coming. It came all night long, and then it became twilight, and the B-52s went away. They assumed, of course, that's the end, and the next day, the fighters came in again as soon as it was daylight. And it was a repeat of the previous day. All day long, fighters bombed. All night long, B-52s. I think that went on from the 18th of December to the 24th of December. On the 24th of December, uh, North Vietnam decided to negotiate uh, Paris Peace Accords, which led to our release. We think that was a fairly direct relationship. We had that idea the whole war. So they finally said, the Paris Peace Accords have been signed and you will be going home. So we got all prepared for that. And the day that uh, we're going to leave, the Vietnamese say, you're going to come out of your cells and you're going to go out to some buses that are going to take you to the airport. Our senior ranking officers said that for all these years they've been saying that we're criminals and we're not prisoners of war. And they said, but we're American military and we're going to march out of here. We'll be in military formation for everything we do. So when they opened the doors and came out, they were kind of surprised. So they all came out and lined up, got in files and started marching and started marched out of the gate. As we went out, the place was full of uh, pres uh, the guards and officers that uh, had taken care of the camp. They were on the second floors and out looking out windows. As I marched out, I saw one guard that I had been around for probably six years or more. He was, just did his job. He didn't, wasn't particularly good or bad. He just did his job. I saw him up here and he didn't wave, but I think he smiled as we went out. So, you know, they were, they were just, a lot of them were just doing their job. But we marched out of this place, and when we got outside this Wallow prison, there were probably a thousand Vietnamese out there, all just curious what's going on. We got into the buses and went through Hanoi. No blindfolds. We could see out for the first time in all these years. And they drove us out to the airport where they had this exchange prisoner exchange ceremony. And sitting out there were big airplanes said U.S. Air Force on them with a big American flag. Something we hadn't seen in a long time. So they took us, put us on those airplanes and flew us out of there. And we were very happy. So we went to uh, Clark Air Force Base in the Philippines. That was our first stop. So we landed there and they put us on buses there. We think we filled up maybe five buses, all lined up. And the buses, uh, they told us, we're going to go to the cafeteria. You can have anything in the world you want. If we don't have it, we'll get it. But you're going to have anything you want to eat. 
So we're going through the base and we see the big mob of people down here in this one area. And one of the guys up near the driver says, hey, can you drive over by that? We want to see what's going on over there. Looks like there's a lot of activity. And he said, yeah, we can go over there. So they drove over there. But when they got there, they stopped. And they had all these people. They had flags and banners and uh, their TV cameras and all kinds of things. And they said, okay, all you guys get off the bus. Said, uh, you've got to be on national television. Which we couldn't figure out what that was all about and what, what was going on there. And we found out all those people were there to welcome us, which we thought was a little strange. You know, of all the uh, hundreds of thousands of people that served in Vietnam, they came home to almost nothing or even negative re reception. People were all excited to see us, you know, which always felt a little uncomfortable and strange, but it was very nice, but it seemed a little awkward to us and still does. So we had a real good reception. That was just one of many, many receptions. And of course, the best one was in Austin, Indiana for me. But uh, we, we did have a lot of those kind of uh, welcomes, which were really nice. Too bad that others of the family of John Robertson, he, he never came home. Yes, but uh, they don't get the, to appreciate all the things that we do. So uh, people, let's see, uh, after we got out, after we got out of prison, uh, we were very, let's say, friendly to Richard Nixon because we think that his action, his courage to bomb and all, had a direct, direct relationship to us getting out. So we said good things about him, and he was having a tough time with Watergate, so he didn't have many friends. And our group was pretty supportive of him. So he was nice to us. He invited us to the White House and had a big banquet there. And he came around and talked to us individually. And when the evening was almost over, he said, let's all go up to my place upstairs. He said, this is the non-public area. Nobody ever gets to go up there, only you guys. Because it's a special deal. Let's all go upstairs. So we went up to his private apartment upstairs. and said we didn't bounce on the beds or anything. but. We got to look at everything. We got to look at bedrooms and run into this house. So he was always our friend that way. And even after he resigned, uh, he invited us out to San Clemente for a party a couple years later. So we always felt good that he had the courage to do something that was very unpopular, but we thought got us out of prison. So people ask, uh, how did the POWs do after they've gotten out of Vietnam? Well, I am, there, there were a lot, what, 591 came out. But my group that I am most familiar with is uh, only about 200. Those were almost all pilots. They were there for a long time, five, six, seven years. And uh, we formed an organization, Nam POW. We include all the prisoners, but this one little group is sort of a subgroup in a group. And so I know about them most. And of that group, when we first got out, three of them were awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor for their activities in prison. Uh, about half of them stayed in the military. I, I don't know the exact number. There's maybe seven became admirals in the Navy. Uh, probably five Air Force generals. The last military man on duty was Ed Meckenbeyer who retired as a three-star general. Um, in the civilian life, a lot of them became airline pilots, since there were pilots are before, like myself. Uh, some, we had three people became medical doctors. One became a veterinarian. Several became school teachers. A few became professors at the universities. Uh, one Episcopal priest. These are the only the ones I know, I can think of. Had um, quite a few became very successful in uh, business and real estate. Probably not quite Donald Trump's, but probably not too far from it also. Quite successful. But it wasn't all a success. We did, we did have a few failures. We had some uh, lawyers and politicians also. <laughs> uh, 
We had uh, several senators. We have a at least a couple of senators. One of them, uh, John McCain, was hoping to run for president. And uh, had uh, several congressmen, U.S. Congress. We have one running for the Senate from Illinois now, I think. The first ambassador, first U.S. ambassador to Vietnam, one of the prisoners, Peterson. Um, so it was a pretty good group. There's, I know one person was a mayor of his little town. They had a lot of stories, you know, many, many stories. But the story I like best, I just heard last year. Went to a reunion in uh, Santa Barbara, California last year. When I was there, I walked up and I saw Paul Carey. I hadn't seen Paul Carey in 30 years. He was a prisoner who had been in a place called uh, Briar Patch, where they didn't feed them very well during one stretch of time. They had malnutrition and not enough vitamins, and because of the vitamin deficiency, he lost vision, the center vision in his eyes. He had his partial vision because he had his peripheral vision, so he could get around, but he couldn't read or see small things like that. So I thought that he's probably going to have a very difficult life when he got out of prison. But here he is at the reunion. He's looking pretty good. And uh, he asked what I'd been doing. And he said, I want to tell you what I've been doing. He says, I'm so proud. He said, let me tell you my story. He said, when I got out, because of my vision, they just wanted to give me a pension, you know, and just, I'd just sit around the rest of my life. But he said, I refused all that. Wouldn't take a thing. He said, I, you know, I'm a farm boy from Wisconsin. And he said, uh, my wife and I went out and bought an old rundown farm. And he said, my wife's really good at painting and wallpapering. And she fixed up the house, fixed it up real nice, put plants out front. And he said, I fixed the fences, I fixed the roads, worked on the barns, got that where it's a really good farm. And we sold it for a profit. And we bought another farm, kind of run down. And we did the same thing. And then we did the same thing. He said, that was 30 years ago we started. We've been doing that for 30 years. And he said, today I don't work at all. He said, and I still own two farms. And he said, let me tell you about just one of those farms. He said, guess what I get for rent on my biggest farm? He said, I just rent it out now. I don't know. What... He said, well, it's actually not a farm. It's a ranch out in Colorado. And he said, I lease it out to a corporate farm. And he said, the rent from that per year is $750,000. He said, that's not too bad for a blind farm boy, is it? <laughs> I had to agree with him. That wasn't too bad. So if you look at the history books, the United States lost the uh, war in Vietnam. The South Vietnam became communist. And uh, so that was a big failure. But uh, when we look back on it, our little group of prisoners, when we uh, marched out of that camp that last day we were there, we were all in formation. And uh, we walked through the gate. We thought about our little war there in North Vietnam. And as we walked out, we felt that we were winners in that war. So we were really happy people that day. So I thank you for your attention. And if you have any kind of questions you want to ask, I'd be happy to, to answer. Thank you. Are there any military men anywhere in the world that are in prison that are U.S. men? Not that I know of. There's a possibility in the Laos. Some people were there after the end of the war, as best I can tell. I mean, it's not a certainty, but it could be. There was no communication. There's those little tribal leaders that could have had someone. They killed prisoners in Laos very quickly. They didn't keep them prisoner. If you were in Laos and shot down, you were usually killed unless you were captured by the North Vietnamese. They were in Laos also. And they would take you to Hanoi. So. The Vietnamese knew you had value and kept you usually. Yep. Before you were pondering your crimes, did you ponder what you're going to do with your back? 
I probably did. I thought about a million businesses, always interested in businesses. Thought about them, talked about them, and did nothing that way. I did buy some real estate, and I do some real estate investment. And, uh, but in general, I was an airline pilot instead of all those things I thought of. You never know what's going to happen. You touched on one of my favorite subjects, food. You said you could have anything you wanted to eat. I just wanted to know what you picked. Did you say about the quantity or the what? What you picked, the first food you ate. Oh. Well, they, when we got off uh, the buses, finally, after a little welcome ceremony, we went to the cafeteria, and they said, when the first group came here, the doctors all told us that the prisoners are going to be mental cases. They're going to really be in bad shape. Their stomachs are going to be bad. They won't be able to eat things. And you should have something like baby food, uh, oatmeal, things like that for them to eat. And they said the buses stopped and they came in and they almost had a riot. They had, they had to dump everything out and then go into the freezers and bring out steaks and things like that. I just went through and ate a little bit of everything. I know one of my cellmates, ate, he said he wanted a dozen eggs and they fixed him a dozen eggs. Yeah. Anything you wanted, they said, we got anything you want. If we don't have it, we'll get it. And they, we were treated the best. They couldn't do anything wrong. It was great. Yep. Did you ever try to or know anybody that tried to escape? Did I know anybody that tried to escape? Yes. I had a cellmate that after he left my cell, he tried to escape. The situation was pretty difficult. We don't look like... Vietnamese. We're much bigger. We look differently. Vietnam is one of the most highly dense, densely populated countries of the world. Uh, the people shot down prior to me from Yuban were shot down at night. The Vietnamese didn't even know that they had been shot down and they were captured within about a minute of hitting the ground. And they had survival radios, they had weapons, they had survival equipment. So, people who did, some people got out of the prison. Several people got out of the prison and they didn't get very far. I mean, just as soon as uh, it's daylight, you're caught. Uh, nobody ever got from inside the prison out, out at all. And uh, we were even ordered not to do so. They tortured one guy to death after he was recaptured. And. Uh, it just didn't look like it was really a very reasonable thing in most situations. If we, you're always supposed to escape when possible, in Hanoi it was quite difficult. Some of the outlying camps you might have had a greater chance and it might have been used more, but no successful attempts anyway. In, in our little group, I know that there's different situations in South Vietnam. I have a question. I was stationed at Travis Air Force Base 1973, being career Air Force. I, I met every airplane that was coming back for Operation Homecoming there. Yeah, we stopped And there. we had a good crowd for every airplane that landed at Travis. They would let all military people off duty, and schools would let out so we could go down on the flight line to see the prisoners get off the airplanes. And I think that was quite, uh, quite nice to see, but it was sure heartbreaking. And it was on national TV every day, too, when they landed. I remember seeing everyone. Uh, did you get promoted while you was in prison? Yes. Yep, I went in as the first lieutenant, came out as the captain, and I was just about to make major after that. And generally in prison, you're promoted at the regular time. They figure that you've been performing well enough to have attained that rank. <laughs> but they didn't know. <laughs> John McCain, did you and him ever cross prison? Were you ever Not in prison. I was never in the same cell, but I was in the same camp with him. I remember when he was shot down. John McCain had the unpleasant circumstance to have his father as the commander of all U.S. forces that were fighting in Vietnam. And he gets shot down with the enemy. That's not what you want to be. You want to be like me, a first lieutenant that doesn't know anything in the back seat, has no information doesn't know anything. You don't want to be John McCain. They beat up on you a lot. They give you a hard time. He performed very well. He was a good prisoner and loyal to the U.S. 
despite all that. He refused to come home. He was offered to go home early, which is not allowed for prisoners. You cannot accept early release. He was offered and refused not to come home. He said, I'll go home when everybody goes home. That's tough to do. That's, I mean, that's a bad place. <laughs> yep. Oh, there's one, one little quiz. You know how people talk with the interrogators? There's this uh, one I remember. I don't know, a person named Jim Warner or something like that. Might have been the prisoner. Anyway, it's right near the end of the war. And uh, the interrogator says, you know, we've been fighting each other for many years now. And he said, uh, the war is almost over. You're going to be going home. And he said, uh, I have won. You lost. And Jim Warner said, mm, no. He said, I'm going to go home to a country you can't even imagine. And you have to stay here. He said, I won. <laughs> and he did. He won. <laughs> Did you have any trouble in readjusting after you got out of prison? Well, I'm the person, so it'd be hard for me to be objective. I thought I was wonderful, but uh, those around me... <laughs> I, you'd have to ask my family. I guess I had a few self-centered times, but you get pretty self-centered in that situation. But, uh, you know, being can't be objective if you're the person. So I felt pretty normal, but probably wasn't. Uh, there were no mental problems. When we got out, we had, um, well, I hope there's no mental problems anyway. Nobody <laughs> <laughs> had a, a psychiatrist a lot of times that's just to check on us. I had, uh, the Air Force gave us, uh, had a psychiatrist had to see every day for many days. And after a couple of days, he said, I'm tired of this. Why don't I tell you about my trip to Israel? <laughs> so I guess I passed. He seemed to think I was all right. He didn't want to talk to me anymore about that. Just wondering if you uh, ever considered making a career of the Air Force. Yes, I did. I thought I liked the Air Force. Uh, I fairly I intended to stay in, but while I was in prison, I heard people talk about the job of airline pilot and what that job is like, and how you get to fly around the world to exotic places with a lot of nice people and you get paid and. You don't have to go where people shoot at you. <laughs> Sounded pretty good, but I was going to stay in the Air Force. They gave me a lot of good assignments. They had assignments all set up. I would be a, an instructor pilot at Williams Air Force Base and a T-38 trainer, which is like the best assignment you can get. And Eastern Airlines called me up and said, since I'd interviewed with a couple airlines on my time off, and they said, uh, we may offer you a job. Will you take it? You'll have to start class Monday. And I said, I'm in the Air Force. How can I take a job on Monday? This is Friday. <laughs> they said, well, if you want the job, you have to be here Monday. I said, it would give me an hour to think about it. So in the hour they called, and I said, OK, I'll take the job. I called the Air Force base, and I said, is there any chance I could get out of the Air Force by Monday? <laughs> <laughs> Guy said, we can do anything. Whatever you want, you get. He said, I'll have you out of here in an hour. It'll be the first time in history, but if whatever you say, you get. Which is kind of the way it was. We got anything we wanted. And uh, he said that uh, he'll start signing papers and just waive all the requirements and waive everything. And he said, some airman has volunteered to run this paperwork around the base, and all you have to come is drive to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base and sign your name. And that was it. I was out. I have no uh, complaint with the Air Force. They're good. How many years did you work airline? She worked for an airline, Eastern Airline. Uh, she worked in pilot recruitment. So if I wanted the job, you know, have to marry her. Kind of 
actually, I saw her the first time I was there, and then it was, I was back and forth many times, and it was a long time before we came across each other again. But we came across, you know, eventually. It was in Miami, and uh, she worked for Eastern, I worked for Eastern. And I uh, see, it was 76, 75, 75. I know the day. It never gets me in trouble. I've learned never to forget the day, but the year gets a little hazy. I think 76. I had like uh, three years. Didn't want to jump into anything there. Well, you've been very patient. One more? Okay, sure. I'm curious, since the end of your ordeal, have you returned to Vietnam? And if not, would you like to? Uh, yes, I've been back to Vietnam. I went back in 1990. Uh, during this time, they thought that Perhaps there were some live prisoners in Vietnam. And they had picture of three people. And one of them they thought was John Robertson. That's my front seater. The other two were in single seat airplanes. So I was the only living person that had any contact with those three people. So there was a lot of activity about that period of time about are there live prisoners left behind. The Japanese uh, television company contacted me and said they would like to do a story about this. And they were wondering, would I like to go back to Vietnam and see if there are any prisoners or, you know, to visit some of my old sites, because they like to make documentaries for Japanese television. I happened to be between jobs, and they were going to pay me, so I went. Went over, had a trip, all expenses paid, and that was Still, you know, not too long after the war, I, before I went into Vietnam, I uh, found, uh, I think it was an Associated Press reporter, and I told him that I was going to go into Vietnam and make a deal. If, if he saw that I did not return at my scheduled time, that he had to write an AP story that would be nationwide that I was stuck in Vietnam. And in return, I would give him the story of my little trip, which was, I didn't want to get stuck there again. So <laughs> we did that, and I went to uh, Bangkok, Thailand, and, and went to the U.S. Embassy there and reported in that I was going into Vietnam. And uh, they were very comforting. They said, well, good luck. You're on your own. We're not going to do it. <laughs> said, we have no control. You get in there and get in trouble, you've had it. And good luck. Tell us when you get back. So we flew into Vietnam, went all around. Uh, Vietnamese were unusually pro-American. I say you walk down the street, they say, hello, hello, America, and stuff like that. Practice English. Had people say, USA, number one, things like that. And they're supposed to be the enemy. They're all very young there. They've, a new generation. Had a lot of experiences during that. Just, Total trip was about 10 days. Went back to the village where I'd been captured. I found the guy with the rifle who had been running. He said, there's only two rifles in the village. He had one of them, and he wanted to make the capture because they get an award, and he saw that he wasn't going to make it. He was still mad about that. He said, <laughs> then I met the guy who uh, captured me. He gets, he's the first guy that touched me. So Le Kon Su is his name. He's a farmer. And he showed me his little award he got. And uh, we've written back and forth a few times. He's, he's getting pretty old now. He was, he was fairly old. I think he was 68 when I saw him back in, in uh, 1990. Uh, we had a lot of little toys that my kids, I had kids by then, so I had toys that my little kids had sent to the kids of the village, gave those out. I gave some things to Le Kon Su. He had a good time because he's like a big celebrity in his little village for this. And uh, it's kind of awkward because they have the Vietnamese would talk to a Japanese who would translate that. So the Vietnamese would talk to a translator who would translate it into Japanese. The Japanese would then translate it into English and then talk to me. And then we had to go back through all this. Very awkward. I was the only American in the group all the time we were there. And uh, I guess Le Kun Su was pretty good. He's just a regular guy, because at the end, 
uh, we had to go. We had a lot of traveling to do because this is really out in the sticks, way out of nowhere. And uh, he said, let these guys, let all these Japanese go back to Hanoi. You stay here tonight, you know. We'll go kill a chicken. We'll have a good time, eat. <laughs> Just stay here with us. But we had to go. Saw where my plane crashed. Apparently, uh, John Robertson probably never got out of the airplane. He probably died in the airplane when it crashed. Um, let's see. One other thing, when we went to uh, Hanoi, the first night, I've been told, when you go to Hanoi, go over to Australian Embassy. They always have a, a foreigner's party on Fridays, and I was going to be there on a Friday. So my Japanese translator, named Butch, <laughs> Butch is kind of a strange guy because he said that when he was a kid in Hiroshima, of all places, he's from Hiroshima, but he watched too many American movies and he just got messed up where he was too much American to be a good Japanese anymore. <laughs> and then he moved to the United States, although he's still Japanese, he's still a Japanese citizen. He said, everybody thinks I'm Japanese. And he says, how can I? So everywhere I go, I'm a foreigner. He says, really strange. So what does he wear to Vietnam? He wears a U.S. Air Force, Army Air Corps bomber jacket with a big flag on the back, American flag, and he's Japanese. So he walks around, people say, where are you from? And he says, L.A. I'm from L.A. I <laughs> say, so you're not from L.A. You're, you're Japanese. Nah. So we go to the embassy, and the Australians are having a party. They let us come in. And we have, to hack, we have to take a government official with us because we're in a communist country. So we have this communist girl with us. She's probably in her 20s. She doesn't get to go to places like embassies. That's not allowed for Vietnamese, but she's official business, so hey, she gets to go. So she goes into this bar there, they have there. And they have a great big TV set, great big thing there with satellite television. It's got MTV on it. She walked into that place and I'm like, ah, oh. she's never seen television. You know, they have little tiny televisions. She had never seen anything like MTV. And she went in there and sat down in front of that and stared at it the whole evening. She never left, just looked at that thing. <laughs> she wasn't being a good communist. <laughs> so the uh, Australians, some of them were a little upset with the United States. And uh, so they were talking, they said, well, the United States should have never been in Vietnam. You know, you just uh, caused a lot of problems and all that. I said, yeah, well, whatever, whatever you think, you know. <laughs> I don't care what you think. Well, that, you know, it didn't bother me, but Butch here, the Japanese, he's going to fight. He won. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a strange situation sometimes. Then another Japanese that was in this group, he said that his grandfather was a prisoner, prisoner of war. I said, yeah, he said he was in American prisons. They're right, yeah, he said he bombed Pearl Harbor and then... Uh... <laughs> you get in a lot of funny situations, don't you? Well, you've been very patient. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, thank you.